You have made it to unit seven of COM 100, and I hope that you're excited to dive into nonverbal and organizational communication. Now, the primary focus of this lecture and unit is going to be focusing on nonverbal communication. However, I like to put an organizational slant on it, and you'll get the drift of that by watching the TED Talk and also considering the importance of nonverbals whenever you are doing a job interview or within the workspace. So with that, let's dive into it. How much of our communication is nonverbal? Communication scholars say it ranges between 75% and 93% of what people take in. And what that means is that people aren't necessarily listening to what you have to say, but how you say it. And that can have a huge impact. A lot of this research is based on Albert Morabian's research in which he found that 7% of what you're saying is the actual words. Then people are paying attention to 30% coming from the tone of how you say it, and then 55% of your facial expressions. So the more dynamic you are, the more people might be taking in. Next, I want you to think about how nonverbal communication deals with all five senses. And you are constantly, can't say it, constantly making meaning of the world around you and pulling from people's nonverbals. So thinking of all five senses, in my classes, I have people stand up next to somebody they have a one minute conversation and we think about like the sound, how and what can you take away from people's sound of voice? Then I have them stare at each other for one minute and then jot down notes of what can you tell about that person merely by looking at them? Then they have some type of interaction, whether it's shaking hands, fist bumping, hugging. What can you tell about uh, that person merely by that small interaction? Then I want you to think about taste and smell. So taste can be really important based upon the environment that you're in. Let's say you go to a restaurant and you either have the best meal of your life or the worst meal of your life. That can definitely give you an idea of what you think about that restaurant merely by a nonverbal. Then smell. Let's say that someone is wearing either the best smelling perfume or cologne that you've ever smelled, or maybe it's a smell that gives you a headache. These are nonverbals that we are taking in all the time that are helping us make meaning of the world around us. So nonverbals, they deal with all five senses and have a huge impact on us. Next, I want you to think about expectancy violation theory. And what this means is that the theory suggests that when interpersonal communication expectations are violated, we pay heightened attention to nonverbal communication in order to interpret the unexpected behavior. A great example of this is I will take my classes to the elevator. And once we're at the elevator, we wait for someone to come out of the elevator and we all start clapping. And it's really funny to see how people react because half the time they'll start clapping along and they're not quite sure why. But we talk about this theory because people start paying attention of, hey, what is going on and how do I make meaning of the world around me? So whenever something violates our norms, we start paying attention to the nonverbals all around us. So have some fun with that. Do something. Maybe you walk into an elevator today and just stare at the wall instead of staring forward. Um, play with violating people's nonverbals. Um, but don't get too crazy. Last, I want you to think about nonverbal immediacy behaviors. And what nonverbal immediacy behaviors do is that it's the use of nonverbals to build closeness. Over the years, I've worked with a lot of TED and TEDx speakers. And whenever they walk onto the stage, I challenge them to think, how can you turn this room into a community? And all of this happens through nonverbals. So I want you to think of the number of times that maybe you've been seat seated in a room and you close yourself off. That doesn't build closeness. So having it during your presentation, an open body, but trying to pull people in, making eye contact with people in the corner, um, is going to draw the edges of the audience in and connect you with them. So how can you communicate closeness through your presentations? And I challenge you to do that. And this becomes really important whenever we're doing interviews. How do we build a closeness with the person who is interviewing us? Let's dive into some important types of nonverbals for you to become aware of. The first one that I want you to think about is the distance that you create between yourself and other people. And that's called proxemics. So let's take a stab at this. So if I were to record all my videos like this, it might seem very intrusive, very close. However, whenever I put you at a personal distance, it seems like we're having a conversation. 
But if I were to put you this far away, it seems like I am talking to someone so far away. Um, this would be a social distance. If I were in a classroom, maybe this is the distance I would be giving a presentation to a whole bunch of people. Well, it would be the class, duh. Point being, I want you to consider how you use proxemics to navigate the world around you. So whenever you're having a conversation with one person versus maybe a group of 10 people, you're gonna be using proxemics to create space between you. And that's all a nonverbal cue. To add to that, are you gonna let everyone into your intimate space? The answer is probably no. Next, let's look at the idea of haptics. Haptics is the study of touch, and this can be so important. Um, I already mentioned on the last slide that maybe you give someone a bad handshake today and ask them how they felt about that handshake. Haptics can have a huge impact on us, but there's a lot of research within the health industry that says if the doctor places their hand on your back and they give you some advice, doctor or nurse, uh, then you're twice as likely to take it. So we can influence people merely by touch. Next, let's take a look at the study of chronemics, which is how we make meaning out of time. And I think this is a very cool nonverbal because people are constantly making meaning of the world around them. Let's hypothetically say that you showed up 20 minutes late to class. How do you think everyone in that room is interpreting your behavior? Meanwhile, let's juxtapose it against you showing up an hour late to a party. Are people having that same impression about you? No. So that's how we're looking at time. Culture has an understanding about like how we view time. So if we go up to a job interview and we show up 30 minutes late, people are making meaning about that and saying, hey, you're not taking your life seriously. However, if you show up an hour late to a party, people are 100% okay with that because we call it being fashionably late. So time is really rooted within culture. And I want you to think about all the situations that you've found yourself in where you've had to explain your behavior because of how we interpret time. All right, let's dive into some kinesics. Kinesics is the study of body movement and how we make meaning about all the body movements that we have. I have quite a few of them listed down here. Hand gestures, posture, facial expressions, leg movements, pacing, and all the body movement. This is what kinesics is all about. One of the biggest things that I work on with students in the classroom is how to walk to the front of the room. There's research out there that indicates that an instructor has already made up their mind about a student's grade by how they walk to the front of the room. And so often in classrooms, students give disclaimers of, oh, I'm not feeling well today, or oh, this isn't gonna be good. Well, if you tell your audience that and your nonverbal communication and kinesics indicates that, then we believe that your presentation is not going to be good. So learning how to walk to the front of the room or even being mindful of your body posture as you are walking up to give a presentation can have a huge impact on how your audience understands you. Next, let's look at the study of vocalics, which is also known as paralanguage. I want you to imagine me giving all my lectures like this, being the most monotone professor in the entire world. Would you be engaged in my lectures? Probably not. I was bored out of my mind while I was doing that. And that's the study of paralanguage. And I have quite a few things listed right over here. Tone, inflection, laughter, crying, articulation, pitch, coughing, shouting, all the things that we're able to do with our voice while we're speaking, even the uh, uh, vocal fillers, those are part of your vocalics or paralanguage. So being mindful of all the different elements that you are using and making it out of your mouth. So I always use an example in class of having people say, I'm so happy today, and having them do it in different ways. So I'm so happy today. I'm so happy today. Um, those give off two very different meanings. So being mindful of your tone inflection, as well as even <coughs> the other noises that come out of your mouth. And that's the study of vocalics and paralanguage. Let's dive into oculesics. This is the study of eye movement as well as pupil dilation and all things dealing with the eyes as a nonverbal communicator. And this becomes so fascinating in an online communication class because you're staring at a green dot on your phone probably while you're recording your videos. So having strong eye contact with a camera is so, so difficult. Even for me, while I'm making these lectures, I find myself cringing at times because I'm like, how are they going to interpret all this information? However, whenever you're in a classroom 
This becomes just as important. Are you pulling people in? Remember this idea of nonverbal immediacy behaviors. Are you taking time to look at everyone and make strong eye contact? Or are you merely staring at one person? I always find it cringe in a class whenever people are giving presentations and they just stare at me. And I'm like, yo, there's other people in the classroom. Make sure that you're sharing the love with your eyes. So take time, consider, hey, how am I using Oculusics in this online communication class versus in my day-to-day -day life where I have to take time to make eye contact with everyone in the room? All right, the next nonverbal that we're going to look at is facial expressions. And I want you to think about how many things that you can do with your face. There's probably quite a few. Um, if I remember the research, there's about 10 different things that you can be doing with your forehead, around 10 different things that you can be doing within the eye region, as well as 10 down here. So whenever you think of 10 times 10 times 10, that's quite a lot of facial expressions that you can be making throughout your day. Um, I added in this fun little piece of research is that people who get Botox have a harder time reading other people's emotions because of the position of their face, like it's frozen. Um, if you've ever gotten Botox before, I've done it twice. It was fun. It was a great adventure. Why not? Um, yeah, it definitely makes it harder to make facial expressions. So they've even done research on kids trying to read people's facial expressions. So let's say your teacher has Botox and you're an elementary school kid. They might not be able to accurately read your expression because of the limited amount that your face is moving. So fun facts with Botox. Woo! All right, the last one on the slide is going to be physical appearance. And I have some things listed here. Clothing, height, weight, tattoos and piercings, skin color, ethnicity, hair, shape, attractiveness, and hygiene are all communicating meaning to us. So what you deem as physically attractive, yeah, you're going to be vibing with that. However, you might find other things not attractive and might cause you to keep that further away. A great way of looking at this in theory is the halo and horns effect. So the halo effect is saying that things that we perceive to be beautiful, we think are good. And they've tried this out in job interviews. And what they found is that with the halo effect, people that the interviewer perceived to be beautiful, they gave them easier questions and were apt to give them more money for the job. But the horns effect, uh, whenever someone came in that they didn't like and they perceived to be not as beautiful, they would ask them harder questions. So thinking about your physical appearance and how it's connecting or not connecting with other people around you can be a very important nonverbal that plays a role in your life. Last three nonverbals that I want us to take into consideration today are artifacts, environment, and silence. With artifacts, what these things are are perhaps like a wedding ring or even clothing that you're wearing, jewelry that are going to be indicating something of meaning to the other person. So with a wedding ring, let's say you're wearing one and you're out at a bar. Um, perhaps people aren't coming up to you and hitting on you because, hey, they know that you're already married. So be thinking about the different artifacts that you might have in your day-to-day -day life that are indicating meaning to other people around you. So for example, it even could be clothing. Something as simple as this vest could indicate to you that, hey, maybe it's a little chilly inside my house today. Or maybe something like my earrings, I just started wearing these this year, uh, can indicate that, hey, maybe this guy is a cool individual. He's hip and he's now. So it's up to you to make the meaning. However, some artifacts have more concrete meaning, like a wedding ring, versus others. Then I want you to think about environment. The environment can have a huge impact on how you communicate, but also what people are picking up. So as it says, factors such as temperature, weather, smells, lighting, and designs function as nonverbal communication. And I like thinking about this example is what makes a romantic setting to you? And yeah, thinking about all the different settings that we are going for in our life. So whether it's homey, whether it's educational, whether it's romantic, how can we utilize these artifacts around us to create an environment that gives off the correct meaning? Finally, I want you to think about silence as a nonverbal indicator. Within the United States, we're not big fans of silence because we find silence to be awkward. However, silence can be a really effective tool at communicating. So we do this with moments of silence within our culture. 
But within each culture, silence can be used differently to communicate meaning. So I challenge you at some point today, find a moment to utilize silence in a conversation and see if you can like create some type of meaning out of that. So in this unit, you are going to be doing a mock interview and you're going to get to practice your nonverbal communication skills in a digital format. So the first question is going to be, tell me about yourself. And I want you to think of this as an elevator pitch that you're shooting for 45 seconds to one minute long. And I provided a template from the Career Center at OCC for you to use while mocking up this answer. Some fun things that I want you to consider is how can you be the most dynamic version of yourself that's going to capture your audience's attention? And then beyond the elements that are on that sheet, add in a fun fact about yourself. Remember, in an interview, you're trying to create points of connection with your audience. And I want you to think of this as you telling a story about your life, like who are you? Um, so you really want to be connecting with the people that you are having an interview with and then ending that by highlighting some of your soft skills. Um, so we have your resume. We already know what you're about, but think of those soft skills. Are you great at organization? Are you great at communicating? Are you a great leader? What would this organization really want to know about you? So as you're doing your mock interview, have a clear job in mind. And I think that that's really going to be setting you up for success. So. Tell me about yourself. Remember, 45 seconds to one minute long. Next, in questions two through five, you have a specific question and a specific answer. So what is your greatest strength? Boom, tell me the answer, but then I wanna know a story whenever you have demonstrated that answer. So what I want you to think about in questions two through five is the importance of storytelling and taking your audience on a journey. Sure, I know we're doing this in a digital format, but still tell us that story and try and make it a full circle moment. Finally, I want you to focus on nonverbals in this unit. So environment, camera angle, clothing, eye contact with the camera, all these things are gonna be so important. Maybe you wanna dress up a little bit so that you're taking yourself seriously whenever you see yourself on camera. But if you can prop your phone up somewhere so that we're able to see a good angle of you, that's going to be so important as well. So consider all the elements of nonverbal communication while you're doing this assignment. So remember, nonverbal communication is so, so, so important. Um, if we go back to the very beginning, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And 93%, well, 75 to 93% of what people are taking in is your nonverbal communication. So the more dynamic you can be, the more expressive you can be, the more you're going to be able to connect with your audience. And this functions both online as well as offline. And some of the textbooks that I've read have said that whenever we're communicating in an online space, we have to be more expressive to pull people in. So I challenge you to think about that as you're making your mock interview this week. How can you really connect with that digital audience and utilize your nonverbals to the fullest?